further ado, please take it away. Thank you. Hi. So uh, the folks at Full Stack Labs that she was referring to are me, <laughs> Thomas, Kai right here, and David. Um, so Kai's our designer and front end developer, um, and he kind of heads up all of that, so anything related to, to design and front end implementations. Um, David's our CEO. I'm the CTO. Uh, so we're a consultancy here in town, and uh, as you might have guessed from our name, we are full stack. So uh, we do everything from uh, websites and complex apps to API integrations, Chrome extensions, uh, mobile apps, desktop apps. Um, our stack is uh, constantly expanding. Um, ever since I heard about React Native, I wanted to do wanted to hear a meetup talk at, a, at one of the meetups here in town, and uh, you know it was so new and, and bleeding edge that you know nobody seemed to have any plans to uh, to, to do it. There was definitely interest, but uh, you know nobody had kind of spearheaded that, um, and. Uh, we started using React back in the uh, the fall, and you know, adding it to our, our uh, collection of, of JavaScript frameworks like Ember and Angular, which we were already using. Um, and uh, we weren't really doing any mobile development um, too much, and uh, suddenly started two mobile projects, which uh, you know we we. Kind of looked around and said, "I think React Native is ready." You know, we had some experience with PhoneGap and, and Titanium and other options, um, and uh, we decided to go for it. We we knew we were taking a risk, um, and uh, we knew it was going to be a, a, a challenge, um, and we were going to learn a whole lot, and and we have. Um, but we have uh, built two really cool apps, which are just about to be launched in the App Store, um, and it overall has been a great experience, and we're happy to be able to share it with you. Um, so just a, a quick show of hands, who here has worked, well, I assume most of you have worked with React or are familiar with it in principle? Yeah, okay, what about mobile development, any kind? Okay, not, not really a good fair amount of people. Okay, uh, and uh, iOS or Android, both? Cross-platform systems, yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, most of what there is to learn about React Native is actually just either in the domain of mobile development or in the domain of React. Um, it's, it's only a small part that is specific to React Native, um, but there's still lots of, of new things there. Um, so this won't be a, a totally uh, polished uh, slideshow, um, so I'm sorry if you were expecting that. It's going to be more a combination of slides and uh, anecdotal experiences and, uh, and some, some live demonstrations. Um, so let me pull up our slideshow here. So for this, let me start playing it first. So we've, we've for, we decided to uh, try a very let's see here ah there we go we got it um, so this app is called slides um, and uh, it's still very new and it's it's you know undergoing development but it's it's promising um, they really are adding a lot um, to their to their UI in terms of features as we go. Um, what's here? Can you uh, enter full screen on here? Uh, upper left eyeball. Ah, there we go. Ah, perfect. Okay. So, um, I think it's overflowing a little bit. Well, you just have to uh, to accept the limitations of, of, of projectors and. Uh, different size monitors. Um, so, uh, oh, there we go. We got an interval screen. Control, Commando. Yeah. There you go. All right. So, 
React Native, what does it allow you to do? It allows you to build apps for across platforms. Um, which platforms? Well, iOS and Android mainly, um, but Windows just has announced that uh, uh, they are going to start supporting it for their universal platform. Um, and even Samsung has for Tizen, which I think is like a, you know, a similar kind of a, a cross-platform um, or cross-device platform, uh, mainly for their, their TVs. Um, so uh, iOS has the most support. Android support is getting better all the time, but it has been robust enough for us to build all the features that we need to. Um, there's uh, lots of little uh, stumbling blocks along the way, um, and I'll tell you about some of those in the presentation. So um, the biggest thing is that you get to use JavaScript and you get to use React. So there's other options for using JavaScript to build mobile apps for different platforms. I mean, you've got PhoneGap and Ionic or Cordova. Um, you've got uh, Titanium. You also have other frameworks within the same category as React Native. And what makes these different is that, different is that they don't use web views like um, PhoneGap. So that's where you basically have a web app um, embedded inside of a mobile app. Um, and they don't use transpilation like Titanium. Um, so they leverage JavaScript uh, as a first class language on this platform. So it's called JavaScript Core. And um, on, on, these plat on the platform that you just saw in the previous slide, um, it, is a, it is a native language. So React Native apps are native apps, um, but you get to use the familiar components that you're used to, like uh, JSX and um, ES6 and ES7. Um, those are fully supported in uh, fully supported in React Native, and uh, a lot of those features work out of the box. So you don't have to use Babel or something like that to transpile those. Um, you can just use them immediately. Things like destructuring and, and, uh, and cla the, the class syntax and ES6 modules. Um, so Facebook started this for internal use um, about a year and a half ago, and uh, or a little more than that actually. And so they uh, rewrote a few of their apps, their secondary um, apps in it, uh, kind of as a proof of concept. So uh, they've got the ads manager, or campaign manager, they've got Facebook groups, um, they've got some other special uh, apps. Um, we have yet to see if they're actually going to rewrite their Facebook app or their Messenger app in it, um, but they are uh, really pushing this and really uh, believe in it, so um, we're going to see it being used more and more. Um, it was uh, last year, like last August or something, that it was, uh, became publicly available. They first announced it about a year ago at a conference, and everybody was eagerly anticipating it, um, the full release. Um, and uh, so it is faster than other cross-platform um, uh, frameworks like PhoneGap. Um, and you're, of course, getting to use uh, React and, um, and get the benefits of that. Um, we're using Redux for our apps. Um, and, uh, and we also use Flow uh, for static, type, you know, you know, static analysis and type checking in JavaScript. That's another open source project of Facebook. So um, I actually don't even have a Facebook profile, and I haven't in several years. But uh, they are so serious about open source that I would actually consider going to work for them if I wasn't already uh, uh, running a consultancy here. Um, and uh, so uh, if a lot of it's going to feel really familiar. The way that you write styles in JavaScript, I mean, in React Native, is just like one of the ways of doing it in React, where you have. JavaScript objects representing your styles, and you just apply that to your JSX elements um, in the style attribute. Uh, and a lot of those like translate pretty directly to web. But of course, there's a lot of like polyfills going on, and there's much less standardization within uh, these mobile platforms than than in the web. Um, I'm working, you know, working up to my eyeballs in React Native has made me really appreciate 
the, the web and the standardization process, that you, know, you have committees that deliberate, that you have vendors who do their best to, to you know, honor these, these, uh, these, these standards. Um, whereas in the, in the mobile sphere, you really don't. Um, and uh, you know, there's surprising differences all the time. Um, so uh, React Native has uh, their own implementation of Flexbox, and in some ways it's easier to use than in Flexbox in the web, which is not hard to use. It's, it seems very unfamiliar when we're so used to the box model and we're used to uh, you know, the doing grid layouts with uh, you know, percentages and things like that. Um, but uh, once you get the hang of Flexbox, it'll be really great and you'll be able to control your layout much more succinctly and making your interface responsive on different form factors will not be as onerous as it often is in the web. Um, there are uh, a ton of components uh, that are built into uh, React Native, um, about half of which are platform independent and are uh, you know, they're just uh, a component like um, a list view or something like that um, that you'll commonly use, or just a view, which is basically their equivalent of a div. Um, and then you've also got platform-specific components, and, and these are just JavaScript wrappers around those. So everything from notifications to the camera and photos, contacts um, to your uh, I mean, vibration, location, um, a lot of them have support out of box for these built-in components, but a fair amount of the time you're going to have to reach for a third-party component. You know, look, look up on you know npm or GitHub and, and see what what looks like the best option. Um, and you might have to try a couple things. Uh, one of the one of the the challenges with any compelling framework that is developed uh, rapidly is that third-party libraries, even you know just little widgets, uh, are it's hard for them to stay up to date with the framework itself. I mean, when you're talking about like a, a six week release cycle, um, you know, people aren't likely to stick with that with their own hobby projects. So you might have to end up forking the library that you found for uh, accessing contacts or something. Um, we had to do that with probably more than half of the third party modules that we're using. But it's not as big of a deal as you might think. Um, they're really, most of them are pretty thin layers around native modules. Um, you know, you look in the source code and there's not that much JavaScript and it's easy to just go fork it, change what you need to, and, and it's done. Um, there is, things are in flux, no pun intended, so you're just going to have to roll with the punches in terms of, you know, finding out that, that something's broken or some third-party module is declaring something and it's a native XML config that has been merged with your app's own config and uh, has, has, has broken something that you only find out when you actually build the app and run it on the device. Um, but it really keeps things interesting. Um, so, uh, you may have seen this from React, um, you, React itself. You know, you've got uh, basically camel cased uh, CSS uh, properties, um, and you're just composing those in JavaScript objects. Uh, and then you apply those to the style attribute, and that can just either be a plain object, or you can have an array that's coming from, you know, maybe you've got some hierarchy, you've got your global styles, and then your component styles and everything, and they're just getting merged together, and your, whatever you declare last is overriding the previous stuff. Um, and uh, a style sheet, you're, these are, the style sheet is an optional component, it's just a way of making your styles um, immutable. Uh, but just the plain JavaScript object is, is enough to apply your style. Um, and then uh, just here's a, a Flexbox example. Is this a GIF kind? No. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and then you'll see we're using some uh, DS7 uh, syntax here with the const. Um, and that is, is uh, just uh, supported out of the box, same with. Uh, Object.assign, an ES6 feature. Um, it's it's a even though the specific styles like um, you know border color or font weight um, all, you know uh, apply align directly with uh, web styles. Um, the whole act of declaring your style and how you organize them is very new, and it you 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 want to 
take a programmatic and, and functional approach to this. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, thoughts, you know, published about CSS architecture, and you can kind of go with different, you know, well-defined patterns. And a lot of times, we're using well-developed frameworks like Bootstrap, Foundation, Semantic UI, or Material CSS. Um, but with this, it's a lot more self-directed. You how how you want to do it. You can do all of your styles right in the component. You could just kind of have style sheets that are you know only styles, and you're just importing those. Um, but of course, there's not you don't have selectors by like tag name or uh, or, or classes or IDs or something. So uh, you 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 have to approach it differently. Um, and we have a lot of like style utility functions. So we'll say like uh, you know like we'll invoke dot flexbox or dot um, dot container or something or dot dot list, and that will kind of inspect the environment. Well, like, am I on Android or iOS? And if so, you, you sort of augment and add your platform-specific styles to it. So um, that was one of our biggest concerns going into this, was like, well, how are we going to just have to duplicate all of our styles in markup um, uh, you know, to be able to, to have this work how we want on, on both platforms? And uh, there's really very few things that we've had to write um, you know, specific to each platform. But the only way to know for sure if things are going to work how you expect them to is to actually try them on the platforms. So uh, one of our um, one of our mistakes was uh, waiting uh, like a month and a half to start testing on Android, um, and we found out all these things where there's just you know discrepancies between the default styles and things that would just you know like make your head spin why why would the default background color be black versus white or why would the default text color be neutral gray as opposed to black um, and uh, why can't I have padding on the left side of the text element but I can't have margin and only on Android not on iOS just you know bizarre things like that um, so uh, yeah, one of the examples for adapting one of the one of the tools that you use to adapt your code to um, uh, to, to the, the platform, um, and, and in this case the, the form factor screen size, is the, the dimensions component. And um, so you're just uh, grabbing the height and width from there. And of course when things happen like the keyboard comes out um, or the device rotates, these are going to change, but you now have just static variables uh, referencing those. Um, so uh, you need to take that into account and you need to be listening for events like the keyboard showing or hiding so that you can adapt your, your layout. Um, it's got a really great animation API that's very powerful and you can just you know, very succinctly um, manage your, your animations and this is directly inside of the JavaScript, it's not nothing to do with the styles. Um, and then uh, for different like layout animations, they've got some platform specific uh, components like um, a drawer view, which is only on Android, or a, um, like an action sheet, which is on iOS. So there's some of these things that are, that, that are just you know, direct wrappers around native components that you may already be familiar with from, from developing an Objective-C or Swift or Java. Um, and then uh, you know, they've got, for pretty much all the gestures like uh, swiping and touching, long, long pressing, um, they've got a, a way to, 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 to use those. So um, it's, uh, you know, this is one of the, uh, I guess the, the, the classic epithets of uh, cross-platform development. I would say that it's not learn once, it's just learn, don't stop learning, learn, you're just gonna have to keep learning as you go. The, the framework is changing, the, the, the platforms are changing, the, the vendors are coming out with new cool APIs um, like uh, Touch ID, um, and uh, you can't yet use it everywhere, but there's a lot of, there's some strong signs that you're gonna be able to use it in more and more places. So this is not just a flash in the pan and a, and a trend that's here today and gone tomorrow, uh, but of course this is uh, you know, software development and with how, how things are in 2016, uh, uh, you know, things, things rise and fall quickly. Um, um, so for your environment or development environment, um, you know, we 
we're just developing for Android and iOS, so uh, that's all I can, can tell you about. Um, you're going to have to have Java, um, at least uh, version 6 or 1.6 to, to run that. Um, and uh, then you're going to have to have the uh, Android SDK. And so this is kind of a collection of tools for things like um, uh, debugging and accessing the logs, even from the device, um, is kind of this, this Android bridge. Um, and then uh, it includes things like Gradle for actually building and you know, compiling your application. Um, and then for both platforms, you're going to need, uh, oh, I guess I should note that for iOS, you're going to have to use a Mac. There's, you know, you can use VirtualBox to run Mac on Windows, but, um, you know, there's, there, there, there can be enough problems as it is that, you, you know, adding that to the mix and adding the overhead of, of, of resources like memory um, is just going to make it even harder. Uh, so like our developers working on our mobile apps have had to, to, to borrow or buy a Mac where we've had to provide it to them um, because uh, uh, you know, they're kind of limited to Android development on, on Linux or whatever system they were using. Um, so, oh, that's supposed to be Android Studio, not, not Visual Studio. I think that was just a little uh, slip. Um, so for both platforms, you're going to need an emulator. Uh, so with iOS, the emulator just comes with Xcode. Um, and then in, on Android, uh, where Android Studio is the equivalent of Xcode, um, that includes emulators. And you just pick one from an available, you know, where you want to use a Nexus or a Galaxy or a, or whatever, and you um, and you fire that up, and it's like a virtual machine on your computer. Stuff persists offline even after you've quit it. Um, so things in local storage, the app stays installed even once you've closed it. Um, Jenny Motion is a nice option because it's just an emulator, whereas Android Studio is kind of this heavyweight IDE that tries to do everything that Xcode does, but for Android. Um, and I have both of them installed, but I mostly just fire up Jenny Motion and run it in there. Um, oh. I guess my caffeine ran out. I've got this little coffee mug at the top of my menu bar that keeps my computer awake. Um, are there any questions so far? Is this too much detail? Not enough? Yeah. Oh, but did you see Naughty Bug Pack? So Webpack is is awesome, and I definitely recommend using it for uh, React projects and you know there is the, the React starter kit that, that uses Webpack um, but it's really not and there is the, the an equivalent project for React Native but it's not as necessary there's a lot of tooling that is built into React Native already like you know including like a Gradle wrapper and things like that um, or they, they try to put as much in there as possible and eliminate the you know external dependencies for critical things like you know, building, compiling, or, or running an emulator on device. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, for all built in modules, you can use import statements. For most third party modules, you, you can. However, some authors just uh, neglected to, uh, you know, export using that syntax. So, you need to use the CommonJS required, I mean, just like node modules. Yeah. Um, yeah sometimes <clears throat> when, when you try to, like, to run a build, you would actually connect to the wire to the device. Yes. Would that be maybe faster than the emulator? Um, so you would think that the apps would run faster mm -hmm. on the device, um, and for the most part they do. Uh, but we do, you know, like with one of the apps we're working on, we're, we see it performing faster in the emulator, mm -hmm. and we're still, you know, working on figuring out why that is because. You know, like the couple of the developers in the team, they've got, um, they're, they're working on Macs, but they're only running the emulator. They don't have iPhones, so they don't know what, how the app is behaving, and we have to, you know, tell them. Like, just today, we're going over, like, well, now, see if there's this delay right here before it transitions, and things like that. Um, there's always unknowns that are hidden and, and just, just waiting to, to pop out um, that you won't, you know, run into until you run it on the device. Um, but uh, I'd say I... You know, we'll run it on the device about once an hour, certainly after every significant change. Um, and in the meantime, just running it on the, uh, the emulator because it's just 
it's uh, faster to just you can just reload that and just hit you know Command R and it'll reload an emulator because I tried a couple of years ago with the Android double tap and I found the emulator that they had was so slow. <laughs> I had to look up why that yep. was my impression. Yeah, so that's one thing. Like Android Studio has built in like default resource limits where yeah. it'll be uh, noticeably slow if you don't change those. And then Jenny Motion is just the resources it's limited to is, is decided by the VirtualBox instance. Yeah. So if you've only allowed like two gigs of RAM or something, that's all it has. Um, that's your YouTube? That was my question. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So if someone, is, uh, I made a, like an iOS app in Swift before, but is there anything fruitful to learning how to build native apps in this Android and iOS first before getting into React Native? Because the only uh, experience I have so far is watching like a Twitch stream of somebody building a React Native app from scratch, and everything they were doing to kind of get through was all of their frustrations in Swift before that they were able to develop quicker faster. So I was curious from your point of view. Is there anything people are learning the older ways first before getting into this? Um, let me touch on that later when I think I, I have a slide for okay. uh, kind of the competition. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the React Native has a, has a built-in uh, a CLI. Like that's what you actually need to install first to be able to start <coughs> um, a React Native project. Uh, and uh, of course there's an init command which is going to scaffold out uh, uh, the template for your app um, and then there's commands to run on iOS and Android and uh, like on iOS this is just going <coughs> to fire up the simulator kind of like a, a headless simulator without opening up Xcode and just run it there um, that's that's all you need on iOS Xcode is optional but the Configuration of an iOS app is so convoluted that um, it, it's, it can be helpful to use the iOS app uh, and the Xcode to you know declare like what permissions you need and you know what what are your target platforms in the API version that you're targeting things like that um, and definitely the the thing you really I guess you have to use Xcode for is is signing it's pretty hard it's you know not easy to do that um, in the command line um, Apple makes you jump through a lot of hoops to like you know verify that the, this app is yours and you built it and it hasn't been tampered with and it's safe to run on the device and, and all that. Um, whereas uh, with Android, it's, you just basically compile it to an APK file, which Android users may be familiar with, and then you just need to go into your settings on the phone and change a couple things. Say like, yes, allow untrusted apps from unknown sources and you know enable developer mode, things like that. And, um, and then you just basically you put the APK file on there and you click install and, and you've got your app. Uh, there's also a helpful command for, um, for upgrading. Because there's so many files that are part of the, this, the scaffolding, like for, for iOS and Android, um, just that default configuration, um, you, uh, they make changes to the, to the, the uh, template config files. And um, to keep up with those, uh, you want to run this uh, React Native upgrade command, and you walk through your files, you look at the div, you say, okay, uh, do I really want to add that change, or are they just trying to reset this, this block of code back to what it originally was, however, I've, I don't know, I want to keep, you know, what I've just, I, these are a list of custom fonts or something like that, I, I don't want to, yeah, so just make sure you're, you're diligent about that upgrade process. Um, it is, you know, they are on a fast release cycle, so like, uh, you know, I upgraded, uh, I wasn't, couldn't have been much more than a month ago uh, to O24, and just the other day they came out O26. So I, we've been kind of doing two minor versions at a time, um, and uh, uh, one gotcha that we really ran into is uh, with your uh, your dependencies listed in, in package JSON. Um, don't use the fuzzy. Uh, operator like you lock them down to absolute versions because I know they're all supposed to be following semantic uh, um, uh, semver uh, and they're you know they're they're supposed to go up a major version if there's any uh, breaking change but a lot of these are just like you know personal projects by open source developers um, and they have no reason to you know comply with that and then the framework itself uh, is uh, is um, 
not yet 1.0. I mean, just like you know, we react to like a you know 0.15, and 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 React Native is like 0.26. So like they still haven't hit 1.0, so they're not obligated to avoid breaking changes. So there's just no reason to let your dependencies, either the direct <coughs> ones or the secondary ones that they depend on, to bump up versions. We have run into serious headaches just because some minor, like just a, a development dependency, like a logger. You know, jumped up a couple minor, you know, tiny versions, and suddenly, you know, it, we couldn't even like log anything in the console. So uh, we, you know, there's a create a file called npmrc, and then you uh, you just specify it to use absolute versions. Um, that's that's a pro tip. Uh, so React Native comes with uh, some pretty powerful developer tools. You know, like in the browser. Um, so you've got. Uh, Chrome debugging, so this uses WebSockets to kind of uh, shuttle uh, data and, and events to the browser and allows you to inspect it right there in, in the Chrome dev tools. Um, and then there's also hot reloading and live reloading, and we still haven't gotten those to work satisfactorily, so we generally don't use them. Um, the inspector <laughs> is helpful for inspecting layout. It's, of course, it's not as feature rich as a browser um, inspector. You can't like <coughs> toggle CSS styles and see what happens. You can't like delete or modify your, your elements, um, but you do get to just click on things and, and see what, uh, what styles are being applied to them. Um, there's also a performance monitor in both platforms. Um, and then uh, there's actually a really, I mean, Xcode has, has a powerful performance monitor built in. But uh, React Native has provided one for, for Android that really lets you see where everything's happening. Like, is it at the native layer, or is it at your own app code? Is it within the framework? Like, what's happening? You can find out that you're skipping frame weights because your, your, your JavaScript is too slow, and your, your, your transition is uh, stuttering. Um, so the, uh, the packager is what takes all of your the files for your app and turns it into a native app. Um, so that's going to compile the native modules, you know, that are in these third-party packages or, or custom packages, um, and your your it's going to compile your JavaScript code into like a single file, like index.ios.js or index.android.js, and basically that's your whole that's all your JavaScript code, and that's what can be reloaded just with a, a shortcut or clicking reload in the, the developer tool. Um, uh, the, uh, to, if you've made a change to any of your like, you know, Android or iOS config or you've made any kind of, you know, changed your native modules, you've got to do a full rebuild of the app, which doesn't take that long. There's ways to speed it up, like using a, like a Gradle daemon for, for Android that'll, you know, watch for file changes and, and rebuild in response. Um, Another dependency is uh, Watchman, um, which is another Facebook uh, project, and, and that is you know the primary thing that they use for uh, uh, listening for file changes. Um, so uh, oh yeah, and here's the uh, the, the debugger. Um, you can't it's mostly cut off here, um, but this is where you can see um, like if you just say console.log, that's going to show up there, but it doesn't show up in the app. If you say console.warn or dot error, which these are polyfills and do exactly what you would expect in a web app, um, that will pop up this red or yellow, they call it the red box or the yellow box. These are like error or, or warning box that go over the whole screen and show you the whole stack trace and you get really used to seeing them. They're, they're pretty scary at first, but uh, you know, at this point I'm ready to just make a TV show, a, a, t a t shirt um, with the screenshot because I've got so many, my desktop is just, filled with uh, screenshots, so um, let's see here. Uh, oh, before I go to that, the, so one thing uh, to note, um, which if you've done mobile development before, you'll understand that there's like debug builds and release builds, and debug builds are where you can see everything happen. There's, you know, everything can be logged, error messages are more helpful, you know, things like that. And then uh, a release build is like a, kind of like a, a production build of a web app. Um, and that's where things are going to be minified and they're going to be it's closer to the uh, environment um, that the app will actually be running in when you release it. Um, and so there's equivalents of those for both iOS and Android. Um, debug builds are noticeably slower, especially on Android. Um, 
And uh, like, I, you can do a debug build on both devices, but I generally don't even bother doing a debug build on Android devices because it's so slow. I just take the time to generate the APK file, you know, it'll probably be 15, 30 seconds, and then I just drop that on the phone and reinstall it. Um, you know, you'll, if you want to do a full, know that there's no leaky state between one version of the app and the other, you just uninstall the app that you had before and reinstall a new one. You know, that way there's no expired access auth tokens left in mobile storage or things like that. Um, let's see here, how are we doing on time? I don't, I tend to go over with these things. Um, I'll try to, to wrap it up within 15 minutes. That, that time. Oh, and then turn it over. Right? <laughs> oh, I, I do want to turn it into a discussion and do be able to do any kind of demoing that people are interested in. So, um, so some of our developers have built kind of hobby apps with React Native, like uh, time trackers. Um, if you if you look at the showcase on Facebook's uh, uh, docs for React Native. Um, a lot of the uh, sort of like, you know, the apps that look like personal projects tend to be things, they're either like uh, clients for, client apps for um, open APIs like uh, Hacker News or SoundCloud or things like that, you know, and there'll often be, you know, like there's already multiple uh, of these client apps for those APIs in the App Store, but then, you know, somebody wants to show, well, I, you know, show themselves that they can build it in React Native, so you'll see those. Um, but the two, you know, production apps, client apps that we are are almost ready to release is uh, Yaya on the left and Bunk One on the right. So Yaya is a total greenfield app for um, for a, a startup, um, and it's uh, I guess the tagline um, that best describes it would be uh, uh, business focused chat for the gig economy. Um, and so you know, think of like Thumbtack or Angie's List or something, but just loose and only semi-formal, semi-structured and, and based around chat. You know, instead of trying to be the middleman, it's everybody's uh, able to sort of sort things out for themselves through chat. Um, so we had to solve a lot of, you know, technical challenges specific to chat and web sockets for there, but, um, you know, React Native didn't prevent us from doing what we need to do. Um, and then Bump One is the a mobile app to go with an existing web app, a startup that's been around for a few years, and this allows parents to uh, view photos of their kids at camp um, in real time and favorite them, share them with other family members, to actually send notes to their kids that the kids then receive in printed form, and the kids can then handwrite a note back and it gets sent to the parents, so um, uh, they're able to stay in touch without having to wait for snail mail and without having to give the kids access to a device at camp. Um, and these have been a lot of fun to build and uh, we put a lot of work into them. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, I have a whole section on gotchas. I had so many screenshots to share here that I couldn't make slides for all of them. I've, I've mentioned several already. Um, you can use any node module or NPM package uh, that is pure JavaScript. Just be warned that you can't use things that have native extensions. Like, Something that has a lot of node modules out there, just like a lot of Ruby gems, are wrappers around uh, C extensions, and um, you know that are written in C or C plus um, plus, or soon to be Rust, um, and uh, those are not going to work on, um, on 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 in a React Native app. So uh, you know, just uh, watch out for that. Um, oh, the the discrepancies between default styles will drive you a little crazy, but uh, once you learn to, to look for them um, and know that just even the simplest of changes to style is not going to necessarily look the same on both, um, you know, you can, you can handle it. Uh, the, at worst, you just create a wrapper component, like let's say around text input. On most versions of Android, there's a, a box shadow by default inside of the, um, the text input, and there isn't on iOS. And, uh, and so the way to deal with that, instead of having to specify that everywhere you're rendering a text input, is just create your own text put wrapper component and declare that as a default style, and then just change all your imports to come from there, and everything else is the same. Um, not, not too big of a deal. Did you have a question? Like, if you have these platform instructions, how do you deal with that? Like, if they can say, you know, if this is iOS, then I do this, if you have Android, you do this. 
Yeah, I can basically show you an example of that. So you've, you've got some, a set of key tools, like you can say platform.os, and that'll just be a string, iOS or Android. Um, you can use dimensions to inspect the screen size. You've got uh, also a pixel ratio component for finding out you know, if it's a retina screen or not. Um, and that reminds me that like, uh, in terms of handling assets and, and images, um, that's one of the areas that like, React Native is not as, um, as streamlined as Titanium is, where Titanium has kind of like, I think PhoneGap does too, has kind of a built-in way to like, it will just, you just name your files and folders in the assets directory a certain way, and it'll just know to use this icon for this platform and this one for the other, whereas as you kind of have to just roll your own solution in React Native. Um, let's see here. Um, you, once, I'm almost done with the slideshow, and then I can, can show you real examples here. Uh, here's just a quick list of some resources. Of course, there's the docs, official docs, um, the blog, and then you'll see tons of other blog posts um, just by you know, developers and, and different companies. Um, there's a, a pretty good newsletter, email newsletter, that goes out regularly, um, and that's from a guy named Brent Vatney. I don't know how to say the last name, but he's, he's, uh, he, he, his name comes up in the React Native community. Um, and then there's like a list on GitHub of just like the whole kitchen sink of um, tooling and resource and stuff for, for React Native, just like there is for React and Redux and that stuff. Um, UI Explorer is this really cool example app that um, that uh, Facebook has uh, includes in the source of of React and um, or of React Native. I'm sorry, now I'll actually show you that uh, really quickly in a second. Uh, React Native Playground is kind of like the code pen of um, React Native, and uh, it uses this service called uh, Appetize, which is close to the bottom of the list, and they <laughs> basically spin up these. Um, emulators for you and then uh, let you interact with it you know, pretty much like you would if the emulator was running on your desktop, but it's just in the browser and it's great for, um, for uh, client demos or just you know, proofs of concept on the web or maybe you're trying to get some support on, uh, on like Stack Overflow or a GitHub issue and people want to see an example. Now it's becoming you know, common with, uh, you know, with, with web technologies to uh, say like, you know, show me a code pen or a JS bin or JS fiddle or something that just has the, the necessary code to replicate the problem. Well, people are saying, hey, can you, can you put something on, on React Native Playground or embed something with Appetize to, to show me what's going on? Um, there's a podcast called React Native Radio, and this is from the same people that have brought you uh, uh, JavaScript Jabber and the Ruby Rose um, and, and several other podcasts. Um, and uh, Product Panes is this, is this new platform that's like, I guess, a way to complain about problems with uh, different tech products, anything from a huge platform like Facebook and Airbnb to open source technologies to actually physical products. Um, and I hope it takes off because I like the idea. It's not just complaints, it's also like to suggest improvements and to discuss it. And it just kind of is filling this, this niche that isn't met by Stack Overflow or GitHub issues. So uh, React Native is one of the open source projects to embrace it first and uh, they're directing people there like, hey, if you just want to you know, basically gather support for changing something, or if you want to make it known how big of an issue this is, not just for you, but for other developers too, go there and, and, and discuss it. Um, I hadn't really used Flexbox much before I got into React Native development, and Flexbox Bragi was this, was this really cool um, game, a tutorial, um, that just incrementally uh, introduces you to the, the different um, uh, techniques in, in Flexbox. Um, so we'll be adding more to this slideshow, and we'll make sure to uh, share it. I'll, I can uh, put a link on the... Uh, on the meetup page, but you, know, you can look there for, for getting all the, the notes that you want. Um, I would like to thank you guys all for coming, um, and uh, I'm really excited to find out what you guys end up developing and to you know, keep in touch with, with you guys. Um, do you have anything to add, Kai? Oh, yeah, my, my only, so, um, Okay. Uh, so, as a designer, uh, React, Native, Re React Native has been really interesting 
uh, in the whole CSS architecture stuff that Thomas has talked about. Um, and just like a lot of things with React Native, CSS Flexbox stuff is probably the most in flux. So there's no like bootstrap equivalent for React Native right now. My hope is eventually there will be uh, because a lot of this stuff is like, you know, hey, we're kind of building our own little mini framework for this app and, you know, some, we're, we're learning the best practices as we go, but there's a lot of stuff where, you know, you're defining constants for device width, creating variables, you know, things that change from platform to platform. And so I'd be interested in anyone that has experienced CSS with React Native uh, to hear your thoughts and your experiences with that. So let me know. Uh, wait, but one last thing. I think I'm just going to take a quick look at my notes and see if there's any key points that I missed, maybe things that we just forgot to, uh, to do a slide for. Um, oh, yeah, like so routing. Um, you know, you're, you're probably familiar with the concept of routing from web apps. Well, you also need a router or some way to navigate uh, mobile apps too um, to be able to. Uh, pass to mount and unmount components to be able to go back and to um, jump to other places uh, and um, that's that's a really key uh, part of your application's architecture and um, there is this very sort of minimalist navigator component within React Native and um, it's not totally intuitive how to use that in your application so most people reach for a third-party library that like kind of adds all the with, the, with the navigator, it's like you, you declare kind of these uh, things specific to each route within the component itself. It's not like you have a, one big file called routes or a collection of route files that all are, are you know, uh, composed together. Um, but that's what people are expecting for routes. So that's why they use these things like the React Native Router Flux, which kind of just works with uh, different Flux libraries out of the box. and um, it kind of encap encapsulates all your route logic in one place. Um, but it's like I said that you, you don't have, you're not guaranteed stability or documentation um, or even continued development when you're using a third party solution. So that was one of our first big pain points was this uh, routing library that we had started using. First we were using React Native Router Redux, which was Redux specific found out that the developer had abandoned it in, flip, in favor of this other library he created, which was ju just generic to Flux. And um, uh, if there was no documentation, the, the, the maintainer wasn't very cordial in, uh, in terms of, of GitHub discussions. Um, and there was just a lot of limitations to it. And uh, you know, we upgraded from you know, version one to two, and we we're kind of like set on that. We were, did not have the, the, the bandwidth to then upgrade to three, which apparently fixed a lot of the issues that we had with it. Um, we said, you know what? We looked inside the code and we said, this wouldn't be that hard to replicate ourselves and we'd be able to you know, do whatever we want with it. We wouldn't be limited, you know, because it was combining like the nav bar at the top, you know, like the back button and stuff, and the, and the tab bar at the bottom, like with your routes, and those are really kind of separate things and we wanted, we felt we could just handle it ourselves. So we implemented our own router and uh, we're pretty proud of it. Um, and it's, it's been a lot more flexible. Um, and uh, you know, once we get these apps out the door, this might be a, a, a good candidate for an open source project to release. Um, but there is this experimental router within React Native, which until now has not been documented, but it has been there. And so a lot of these routing libraries were tapping into that. So um, maybe by the time you guys are building an app yourselves, um, this will be, this experimental router will be ready for, for prime time. So uh, keep tabs on that. Um, <clears throat> oh, testing, we've kind of, Put the uh, we put the pause on testing uh, for now because we've had to uh, develop so rapidly. But um, soon here we'll we'll go back and you know fill in more of our integration tests once we kind of have our logic uh, uh, scaffolded out. Um, another one of Facebook's projects is Jest, and that's um, they're kind of like the 
the go-to library for testing, but it's, it's really more for unit testing. Um, to do something like um, integration testing or your view or feature specs, um, you know, like in, in Rails, you might be using like Cucumber or Capybara or something, um, uh, or some solution that, uh, that, that utilizes um, Selenium. Well, there's something called uh, Appium, which kind of uses Selenium for mobile apps, um, and uh, you know it works. It supposedly works well with React Native apps. And then there's even a service called WebDriver. Well, it's not a service. It's another library called WebDriver, I guess, which really like ties that together um, and allows you to run it remotely, like on a, on a server or something. Um, so, uh, oh, and the distribution. So um, I you know, talked about running it on, a, uh, on the emulator and on the device. You know, with the device, you just have to hook it up there. Uh, Android, you've got an APK file. I don't know what exactly that stands for, but um, pretty much that has everything in it that you need to install the app from you know, metadata, like the name of it, and permissions, and the app icon to all of your code. Um, and we didn't find this out right away, but there, uh, on iOS, there's an equivalent called an IPA file. And um, you uh, have to jump through more hoops to be able to generate that. But in the end, you can share that file, and that's all they need to install it on their phone, your, your beta testers. Um, because of the, the, you know, the added burden of like, you know, signing and your per credentials, provisioning profile, your certificates, all that stuff, um, Apple does kind of encourage you to use these two streamlined services for distributing these apps for kind of like over, over the air installation and updates. And one of those is called Test Flight, and the other is iTunes Connect. Um, and they seem like good ideas, but we haven't started using them yet. So far, we're still doing the manual uh, installation. And so, like, if you are giving them an IPA file for somebody to install on their iPhone, they're going to have to hook up their computer and then go into iTunes or Xcode if they have to be a new developer and install it there. Um, Apple recently came out with this app called Configurator, which has, is, seems very helpful. Um, that's what I've started using. Um, but that allows you to basically load up an entire profile on your, um, uh, kind of like a blueprint, that's what they call it, on your testing devices. So that can include everything from settings, like allow notifications, don't allow access to my location or something like that, because you want to test that, you know, if, if the app can handle that. Um, and uh, you can also like load up other apps on there at the same time. You can load it up with photos and contacts, all these things that, that so and before we were having to just create manually to, to, to test those, those features. Um, but that is just a Mac app. Um, oh yeah, how it compares to the competition, I guess, in my final note of why, why the, the compelling reason to use it. Um, so, I think that Swift looks like a very compelling option. Um, I mean, just to, for iOS, like it has a lot of the, address a lot of developers' issues with Objective-C and is more JavaScript-like, more functional. Um, but then you're, you're getting the benefits of writing a you know, you know, true native language. Um, and if you're really only, you know, I mean, there's, there's so much to learn from mobile development that I would honestly recommend for you, like getting started with this, to pick one platform or the other, um, and I don't think that Swift. I think Swift has a promising future, and there seems to be other platforms like rumors of Google supporting Swift on on, on, on Android. Um, and you know, you can use Swift uh, to write you know Mac apps too, which is kind of a more esoteric thing, but but can be pretty cool. Um, just because it's a native language doesn't mean that it has more of a stable, like long-term outlook. Like, look at the whole fiasco with Java and Oracle suing Google. Um, look at you know Objective C being deprecated in favor of um, you know, of Swift. You know, just because you're using the like uh, proprietary language of the platform doesn't mean that like you're going to be able to use that indefinitely. Like, you know, no matter what, you have to be willing to kind of like jump technologies and try something else. Um, what it boils down to, I think, for why to use it, because I can't, I haven't done Java or Swift Objective C development um, for for mobile apps, um, so I can't really speak uh, accurately there. Um, what it comes down to is that you get to use JavaScript and you get to use React. Um, well, you have to use React, so that can be both a pro or a con, you know, depending on who the developer is. 
Um, things like native script, which is very similar to React Native in terms of the implementation, um, is framework agnostic. You know, you you don't. It's just as new, um, but it doesn't have the React framework baked in. Um, you, it strengthens the same tool, skill set that you're using uh, to in your Node app or your client side web app. I mean, if I had if built these apps, in, if we had built these apps in the native languages. I would have forgotten a lot of the JavaScript that I knew beforehand, but now I'm just a better JavaScript developer than I was before. I've solved more challenging problems and I've learned, added things like flow to my tool set. So that's, that's what it comes down to. Um, you can also more easily onboard non-mobile developers. Like you've got a back-end person who's you know, pretty solid as a JavaScript developer. Well, you can ease them into this to kind of augment the rest of that team um, whereas opposed to like Swift or, or, or uh, Java, it's like such a big textual uh, uh, rift that like it's hard to like jump back and forth between these things. So you're more likely to have a dedicated native developer on the project who uh, like if they're waiting for some new API endpoints, they're just kind of twiddling their thumbs until those are ready as opposed to just being able to have the React Native developer switch to the back end and do something there. Um, yeah, so that's that's all I've got. Uh, thanks for listening to all, listening to me pontificate and ad lib. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, do you have any experience with like, uh, or can you like integrate like Crush Analytics or like Sentry or something straight into? Yeah. So we we've tried a number of error monitoring services in our web apps. Um, we ended up settling on Bug Snag, and um, that's actually kind of at the top of my list of things to do right now is to implement that in in the web app. Um, but it looks like the easiest option out of the box is um, Fabric, which, so, so Twitter bought Crashlytics and then they've got this like, kind of like multi-faceted uh, developers APK, uh, SDK, um, that it basically includes, Crashlytics is now a service of that. And then it also like has, you know, helps you deal with like, uh, you know, analytics and, and, you know, user monitoring, behavior monitoring. Um, and, uh, and you know, uh, kind of social dealing with this social network APIs, um, stuff like that. So that's probably what we're going to try first. Um, I you know, don't have a, a positive answer yet. Um, and uh, it's, it's definitely going to be. I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be trickier than. There's going to be more to it than just uh, than how it is in the web app, where you just kind of drop in the script and it'll just catch errors and send them. You know, you have to. Well, even in a web app like you know Ember or React, like you, they have their own internal mechanisms for error handling already that you can't like expect Bugstack or Sentry to just work the way you want it to. Like you gotta kind of finesse it into there to, to get it to work, and then you deal with it like swallowing errors in development, and you don't see them in the logs and stuff. So um, I, I know that I that I'll, I'll have to really you know be taking into account the component life cycle and and the routing and everything, and also to just know if you're connected to the internet, because a mobile app is not connected to the internet more often than a web app is. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, all those things. Um, there was another hand back here. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. I was, uh, so you mentioned the web sock. What does that code look like for, like, how, how did you go about doing that? Um, so we, we're using Socket.io, and, um, and the Socket.io client will work in a React Native app. It used to have a native component to it, but they've removed that. So now you can, can just drop in the Socket.io client library that's just pure JS. Um, you know, there's also client libraries for Android or iOS. And maybe those would have some, some performance benefits, but we haven't bothered um, working with that. Uh, we have two backends for, for this the app, that, that the chat app, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of those is a Node app, and that's where we're using Socket.io. And the Rails app is for our RESTful API, so we've embraced JSON API for that. Um, and uh, really, to have like kind of parity there, or congruence, we need to be able to, you know, emit socket events and listen for them in the Rails app. So we'll probably use something like Bay for that. And we need to be able to serialize um, you in JSON API format from the Node app. But there's not really like any proven and tested uh, solutions for that yet. There's a handful of libraries, but so we kind of have these, uh, you know, this, this, we, we don't have a full overlap of functionality there, um, but we will, you know. Yeah, Socket.io kind of requires you to use Node on the back end, 
but uh, one of the developers in our project was very savvy in terms of WebSockets, and he said, no, we can just implement this ourselves. I've created a, a, a WebSockets library. Um, so uh, when we kind of take that into our own hands and really start using sockets for lots of different events and we're you know, triggering all the push notifications, um, we'll, we'll have to come back to that. But so far, Socket.io has you know, got us this far. And then what are you guys using to Make HTTP. Oh, good point. That was one of the things I meant to mention. Um, so, uh, React Native has really embraced uh, the fetch spec. So, um, you know, hopefully that'll be here in Chrome and Firefox and stuff soon. Um, it's it's pretty well spec'd out. It's promise based, and it's it's just nicer to use than XML HTTP requests, which I think you can still use in React Native, but they kind of discourage it. Um, so you're using fetch and uh, uh, you know you're dispatching events and deserializing things in response and we've, we've been able to pretty well encapsulate out like all of our like sort of extract out our action creators and, and have like the block of code where we're making the request is now just like no more than six lines and used to be a lot more where we have to declare our, our headers and like the request options and we make that and we've got to have different callback functions for success and error and now we kind of have are handling those in the same way. Um, we're basically just saying which action creators to uh, trigger upon success or upon error, um, and then doing a deserialization not you know, automatically. Um, yeah. I got one more question. Yeah, I was gonna ask, have you reused any of your native code like in, on the back end node or the browser anywhere? Ah, yes, the, the holy grail here, isomorphic JavaScript apps. Um, you know, it does seem very enticing, but um, so far we have addressed this not through sharing code, but trying to have a very um, smart API that will even declare things like, you know, required fields and optional fields, like what are the associations. So, like, if you really devote energy to that, and, and that's why we're using JSON API, and, and you kind of honor that on both sides, and then you're even using flow type annotations and you have interfaces then you've kind of got like right there in the mobile app you've got like a snapshot of what what the request what the request body is going to look or the response body is going to look like from the server and you can kind of use that for uh, basing your client side logic off of um, I think that I mean even sharing react native code with react code um, I think that it is uh, Gonna be a while before that's commonplace. I mean, people are definitely interested in it, but you know, like experienced, as experienced React Native developers as there are, like on that podcast, are they're still struggling with how to do that, and it'll, it definitely would force you to to have very modular, reusable code. Um, and uh, I don't see us really taking that on for a while. Yeah. Have you ran into any serious? Uh, um, yes, I would say so, but no showstoppers. Um, you know, you've, and also, like, I don't have really experience with native mobile development to to compare. But I just know that in terms of the web, yeah, there's all these things that like it's not it's not as easy as it would be in the web app. Like, who would have thought that the uh, opacity, the background opacity of a container would trickle down to the modal on top of the container. Like I declare a 50% opacity on this, in this background, like why is the modal now translucent? And like things like that. Or um, the, uh, the, the border radius of a child element is not constrained to the border radius of a parent element. So you can see its corners poking out of the, the curved corners of the, of the container. Um, things like that, where it's, you know, it's forced us to not I'd say that we so we did we use Envision app to create our mockups and um, and Kaiser designer and he can create those mockups really quickly and they look awesome um, but we haven't been able to do everything that we did there's things that were it was easy to put in the mockup but it wasn't so easy to implement in in uh, in the, in, the uh, in React Native um, you know where it's just like oh wow that's going to be a problem or like. Like uh, for example, a blur view, which is becoming very common on iOS, either for you know kind of menu bars at the top or like a photo background on like a blurry overlay. Well, there's a few libraries you can use on iOS in React Native that are ready to go, but 
nothing that's ready to go on Android. There's native modules out there, like 500 Pixels has one for Android, but you're gonna have to create your own JavaScript wrapper around that. So sometimes it's just waiting. The, the best thing is that like <coughs> bugs are fixed quickly, new libraries, new features are released quickly. There's a fast pace. You don't have to wait a long time for your, you, you know, your issue to be to be solved. Yeah. Did you did you uh, happen to get any experience wrapping Um, so we haven't. Um, it was all new to me um, how to how to go about that, like learning about the Android manifest and the project PBX, whatever um, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, just getting a little taste of um, Objective C syntax and, and Java syntax. And, um, but uh, we haven't just taken. We've we've almost done it, but we. Have, I guess it just kind of have postponed it. We haven't taken a native library and just said, we're writing a JavaScript wrapper to it. Um, but we have taken other wrappers around, existing native wrappers around native component, native libraries and just changed those ourselves. Like a lot of times it was just a problem in the, the configuration file, not in the code. Um, so yeah. Um, okay, great. Thank you, you guys have been a great audience.